We're going to begin a short section here on boiling point elevation and freezing point depression. It's a really cool phenomenon. So typically, um, water, pure water will freeze at zero degrees Celsius, right? And it's going to boil at 100 degrees Celsius. But once you start dissolving something else into that water or mixing it with something else, maybe you put some sodium chloride, some table salt into the water. Maybe you mixed it with ethanol or rubbing alcohol. Once you dissolve something else into that water, the freezing point drops and the boiling point goes up. So if you have a solution that contains water and sodium chloride, depending on how much sodium chloride is in there, it could potentially boil at 101, 102, 103 degrees Celsius. Um, so on the paper, I wrote that these two things expand the range. So what I mean by that is pure is going to be at 100, but impure solutions will have boiling points above 100, and impure aqueous solutions will have freezing points below 0 degrees Celsius this one in play, especially if you ever live someplace cold, when they start um, throwing the salt on the roads. And so the reason why they do that, um, especially if the temperature is fluctuating around 30 de 32 degrees Fahrenheit or 0 degrees Celsius, right? Um, the concern is that um, when the sun is out, the water melts, and then once the sun sets at night and the temperature drops a little bit, all of a sudden you've got sheets of ice on the road. But if you throw the salt on the road, well, now it's not going to freeze at zero degrees Celsius. Maybe it starts freezing at negative 10 degrees Celsius. So that gives you some wiggle room, um, especially on those days where um, you see a lot of uh, freezing and melting. Um, over here, I have what's known as a phase diagram. These are super cool. They look a little bit different for each substance. And you can do them for elements as well. This is the phase diagram for water. Um, it has a characteristic negative slope for the solid liquid boundary. That's one of the ways that you'll know it's for water. Unfortunately, we're not going to get too much into phase diagrams. However, um, what I want you to take away from here. So why we have phase diagrams is these numbers that I gave you, the 100 and the 0, are under 1 atm of pressure. You may have heard that um, if you're high up at high altitude, the boiling point drops. And that's absolutely true. So the, the solid liquid line is right here. With an orange. And this is 1 atm. So you would go across and you hit that uh, phase boundary. And then you go down and then you get to see, oh, um, the water melts at zero degrees Celsius. Or we could do the same thing for the gas. So we go across, hit this line, and when we drop another line down, we would be at 100 degrees Celsius. And I know that's gonna be the boiling point because I'm at the liquid gas boundary. It's the point when the liquid water turns into a gas. So if I'm not at 1 atm of pressure, maybe I'm at 0.95 atms of pressure. I don't want to go too extreme, right? You can see that this line would be a little bit lower and you're going to hit that boundary a little bit sooner. So maybe now your water is boiling at 98 degrees Celsius instead of 100 degrees Celsius. That's if you experience a change in pressure. So our phase diagrams allow us to calculate our melting points and our boiling points at different pressures. However, they're also assuming that you're dealing with pure substances. So in this case, it's pure water. Our discussion here today is about solutions. So impure water, water that has something dissolved in it. Over here, I talked about the expansion of the range. There's a similar expansion of the range that occurs on the phase diagram. So it's not going to be a definite line because where the melting point occurs is dependent upon pressure, but also 
the concentration of the solute in the water. But I'm just making the boundaries wider with this green marker here. So now let's look at what's going on. So if it's impure, and again, the green represents our impure um, solutions of water. Now the one ATM, now all of a sudden we hit the green area and if we drop the line down, we're going to see the transition at a lower temperature. And then if you go all the way across, you're looking at boiling points. You have to pass your original boundary to get into the green zone. And so when you drop the line at that point, you're going to experience higher temperatures. Um, so super cool, super powerful tool tells us a lot about the behavior of a substance. But again, the big takeaway here with both this and this is that impure solutions, and it could be water, but it could be any other solution, impure solutions experience an expansion of the freezing point and boiling point ranges. The last thing to mention before we move on to the formulas and start the mathematical calculations is that the freezing point and boiling point of the solution depends only on the number of dissolved particles. So it doesn't depend at all on the identity of the particle itself or the identity of the solute. We have to be concerned about what's the solvent, but it doesn't matter who the solute is except for the fact that ionic compounds break into multiple particles. And we'll leave that for the latter half of um, the discussion here. This comes under a broader topic known as colligative properties. So when something depends simply on the number of dissolved particles and not the identity of the solute, um, that's going to be what's known as a colligative property. Over here we have an equation for freezing point depression, and this is the same equation except with the subscript of B, it's for boiling point elevation. So these allow us to calculate the change from what we would normally expect. There's a freezing point depression constant, and that's going to be dependent upon your solvent not your solute. So if you have a bunch of water and you dissolve something in it, you need to grab the freezing point depression constant for the water. And then this little m is molality. And we're using molality here because it's temperature independent. It took the volume away. Um, and now it's not going to fluctuate like molarity would. I is what's known as the Van Hoff factor. It takes the number of particles into account. And we're going to go into more details about that. We need to think about particles because we know ionic compounds, you know, they're going to break into multiple pieces, multiple ions when they dissolve. For now, a lot of the earlier problems deal with covalent uh, substances, covalent compounds. So the thing to know for now, and for later, I guess, I equals 1 for covalent compounds. They don't break apart. So there's no need really to take the number of particles into account. The other thing to take note of, the two equations look super similar. However, the freezing point depression constant for any substance, here I gave you water because that's probably the most common, is going to be different than the boiling point elevation constant. So these two values are not the same. Sometimes students try to use 1.86 um, for their boiling point elevation constant. I just wanted to point out that they are different constants. All right, so for this problem here, I wasn't entirely satisfied with the details that were provided. So I threw in the word aqueous. It's really important that we know the identity of the solvent when we're doing freezing point depression or boiling point elevation problems. So here, um, we have a 2.6 molal aqueous sucrose solution. 
So sucrose is a sugar, it's covalent, it just has carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So we know that its Van Hoff factor is going to be equal to 1. So we have the formula delta T equals Kf, and we're going to use the Kf value for water, times the molality of the solution, times I. So I'll do 1.86 degrees Celsius divided by molal. They gave us the molality, so we'll plug in 2.6 and then the 1 if we want to put it. When I solved this earlier, I got 4.836 and the units work out really nicely, right? The molal cancels the molal and we're just left with degrees Celsius. If you're taking a multiple choice test, typically that's one of the answers. But if we think about it, that answer doesn't make any sense. Freezing point depression, it brings the freezing point down. Water normally freezes at zero degrees Celsius. So what's up with this value? There's a second step to these problems. So we need to take the freezing point of the pure substance minus the freezing point, the delta T value, the freezing point depression, and that's going to give us the freezing point of the solution. So the impure version of that substance. So this is for water, this problem. So water typically freezes at zero degrees Celsius, and I'm going to subtract 4.8 36 degrees Celsius, and so we're going to get negative 4.836 degrees Celsius, probably looking at this uh, reported at the 266, right, because we only have 266 with our concentration there. So I would say that the freezing point of the solution with the sugar in it is now negative 4.8 degrees Celsius. I bring up this formula. People oftentimes ask me or students will ask me, well, I just put the negative sign on there. That's easy. It's easy for water, but if you're doing a problem about another kind of solvent and the um, freezing point is not going to be zero. So you're actually going to have to go through this calculation. So this is one of my favorite problems in this section, these molar mass problems. I like them so much, or I really love them, because I can envision doing this in lab. I have done this in lab. Um, because all the data they give you in these problems are things that you know how to collect. So you have 17.5 grams of this unknown compound. There's a big emphasis on the fact that it's a non-electrolyte, or that would mean it's not ionic. And therefore, we know that I is equal to 1. That is important to know. Um, but, okay, so we got the mass of this compound. And then we threw the compound in um, a mass quantity of water. In this case, they threw it in 100 grams of water. Then, you're literally, you put some ice in there as well, and you stir it. And the, the ice water, if it's pure, it'll be at 0 degrees Celsius. But as you're stirring in this compound, it drops to negative 1.8 degrees Celsius. The part that blows my mind is with this little bit of information, this little bit of data that I can easily collect in lab, you legit use a styrofoam cup when you do this experiment um, because it's a good insulator. Now we can calculate, and the percent error is usually pretty decent, uh, we can calculate the molar mass of unknown compounds. So how are we going to do this? Eh, we could memorize a bunch of formulas, or we could just say, okay, what do, what do we know? Well, first off, it's a freezing point problem. So let's start there. So we know delta T of F equals K of F times M times I. So I know I is 1 because it's a non-electrolyte. Um, they gave us delta T of F. I'm going to make it positive because they already subtracted it. They did like 0 minus 1.8. So in this formula, it's just going to be a positive number. So 1.8 degrees Celsius equals 
And then I'll just look up the Kf for water, which is 1.86 degrees Celsius per molar. Um, we said we have I, which is just equal to 1, so I'm going to leave that out. I'm going to divide over. And now I have my molality. Which is equal to 0 0.96774. Um, how are things canceling here? So there was an M here. So degrees Celsius canceled. The M is on the bottom of the double fraction, so that becomes my unit. So far, so good. Now we're kind of stuck again. Um, we have molality. What about the formula for molality? So we know that molality equals the moles of solute over the kilograms of solvent. Well, I don't have the moles of solute. I know the mass, but I don't know what it is, so I can't calculate the mole. I do have molality, and I do know the kilograms of solvent. So let's plug those numbers in and solve for the moles of solute. So I'm going to do 0 0.96. 774. Um, I'm doing the water as 0 0.100 kilograms. Remember, um, it needs to be in kilograms. So I just divided by a thousand. Cross multiply, and we're going to get 0 0.096. 774 moles of our site. And again, now, where do we go from here? Well, we want molar mass. And so I know that molar mass, like if I'm thinking of the molar mass of water, right, I would report it as 18 grams per mole. Well, I know the units of molar mass are grams per mole. Can I use that to help me? So, hmm, I know the grams of my unknown, and I know the moles of my unknown, so I'm just going to divide those two. So after I divide the 17.5 by the moles that we just calculated, and I round to 366, I get 181 grams per mole. Now that's a lot higher than what we typically encounter in an inorganic or a gen chem lab, right? Um, we don't have such big compounds. But when you get into biology, biochemical compounds, proteins, the molar masses get super, super high. Um, so that number doesn't, doesn't scare me or doesn't seem off in the least, um, just knowing that our biological molecules and compounds, um, even sugar, right? Certain sugars are going to have um, molar masses in that range. So it seems decent. Such a cool problem. Involves a lot of critical thinking skills. Before we jump into the nitty-gritty of the problem, I just wanted to give a little bit of background on some of the chemistry about antifreeze, ethylene glycol. So the structure is provided, and we're going to need that to calculate the molar mass at some point. However, if we're just looking at the structure, we have CH2, and then attached to this first carbon, we have an OH. And then we have another carbon with two hydrogens, and that also has um, a hydroxyl group, the OH attached to it. So the name F, F stands for two carbons. So it's something that has two carbons, and then all, I may have mentioned this earlier, the OL ending stands for alcohol, but for chemists, an alcohol is anything that has uh, a hydroxyl group. So this OH hanging off of it. So this is diol because it has two OHs attached to it. 
Ethanol, which is the alcohol we drink, also has two carbons, but it's only going to have one hydroxyl group. There's a couple reasons I bring this up. One is we just finished a discussion on intermolecular forces. The antifreeze will obviously exhibit hydrogen bonding, and so does water. So antifreeze and water mix really well. And if we wanted to put drinking alcohol in there, ethanol, it would also mix very well with those other liquids. The second reason, antifreeze is extremely, extremely toxic. Right, so this again is one of those problems where we may or may not know where to start. Um, they're talking about um, a freezing point and let's leave the boiling point stuff for later and really focus in on the fact that somebody lives in a place where it gets to be negative 20 degrees Celsius um, and they're trying to save a buck, right? They don't want to use pure antifreeze um, in their car engine so they decide to just put a little bit of antifreeze. Um, tough times, I don't know. Um, so how much antifreeze do they need to use, right? How are we gonna do this? Well, let's start with the formula delta T of F equals K of F times M. Do I need to put the I in there? Well, these are all non-metals. So I know that I is going to be equal to 1. It's going to be covalent. So I'll leave off the I. The delta T of F, they're talking about this negative 20, but I'm just going to put it in as 20 degrees Celsius because it's already been subtracted from 0. So I'll make it positive. And then we know uh, the uh, freezing point depression constant for water is 1.86 degrees Celsius per molar. And then this is enough information to solve for the required molality. So they're going to need a molality of, of around 10.75 um, Two seven or so. All right, that's useful to know. Where can we go from there? So we know that we have 6.50 liters of water and we know the density of water. So with those two things, we can definitely get the kilograms of water, which we can use in our molality equation. So let me do that. So 6.50 liters and I know that one liter has a thousand mils. And the problem tells us to assume that um, each mil of water is one gram, but then I got a thousand grams in one kilogram. That's a lot of back and forth for nothing. Because a thousand milliliters is gonna cancel. Well, the milliliters will cancel, but then the thousand cancels. Um, liters is canceling and grams is canceling. So 6.50 liters is going to equal 6.50 kilograms. And that's of water. So now with our molality equation, we know that molality is moles of solute. over kilograms of solvent. So I'm going to do 10.7527 equals moles of solute all over 6.50 kilograms. And I'm going to cross multiply, so I'll do 10.7527 times 6.50. And I wind up with 69.8924731212 moles of solute. 
which happens to be our antifreeze, our ethylene glycol. So since we know the moles, we can say one mole of the ethylene glycol, and then I use that formula, and I got a molar mass of 62.08 grams. That's not enough. I do want volume. We have a density of ethylene glycol, so it would be 1.11 grams per one mil. And since I'm going to be using a soda bottle to measure it, I'll do 1,000 milliliters in one liter. After you solve all of that, you get a very reasonable 3.9 liters. So to play it safe and if there's enough space in the radiator, I would say that the person should add about four liters of ethylene glycol to protect um, the water and the ethylene glycol from freezing. Remember what happens when water freezes, it's going to expand and it could um, destroy the radiator if the water freezes. So we did a lot of the work already. Um, we know that delta T of D equals KD times M times I. KD for water is 0 0.512 degrees Celsius per molal. And we calculated the molality in the first step um, of this problem. So we'll use that same value, just 10.7. 527 molal or so. And then I is going to be 1 because it's covalent. And so I get a delta T of F of 5.505376 degrees Celsius. I kept the whole value in my calculator. Um, probably with this particular problem, um, we're looking at two sig figs at best. So I'll just keep this as 5.5. But they asked, what is the boiling point of this mixture? It's not going to boil at 5.5 degrees Celsius. Water normally boils at 100 degrees Celsius. And I'm going to have to add the 5.5 degrees Celsius so that my new boiling point is 105.5 degrees Celsius. So that's going to be the boiling point of my mixture or the boiling point of the solution, whatever you want to call it. 